Okay. Hi, camera. All right. So this is uh, starting take two. On <laughs> We're talking about HTTPS, and we already talked about the first couple of slides. These are the different uh, things that HTTPS protects against. All right, so secure sockets layer versus transfer layer security. What's the difference? Uh, there's not much. Uh, secure socket layer is older. Uh, SSL is no longer considered secure. It's no longer supported by any of your web browsers, unless you're using something ancient like the Raspberry Pi web browser. <coughs> Uh, so SSL2 is the only one of the protocols here that's not basically the same as all the others. SSL3, the TLS12 are all basically the same thing with just some bugs fixed. SSL2 is very old from the 90s. No one has used it for ages. It doesn't really secure anything very well. Um, SSL3 lasted until uh, a year ago, the Poodle attack. Uh, after the Poodle attack, the browser started disabling it. Uh, so transfer layer security, why is it named differently than SSL when it's really just like a version number bump over SSL3? It's named differently because uh, SSL was associated strongly with Netscape Navigator and Microsoft didn't like that, so they just wanted a new name for the standard protocol for them to agree to implement it. Political reasons. Uh, TLS 1.2 is the current protocol, it's what servers should be using all your browsers for TLS 1.2. So TLS is broken into two basic parts. First, you have to do a key exchange using public key encryption in order to uh, agree on keys to use for the private key encryption portion of the session. And so uh, public key encryption is very expensive. You don't want to use that for the entire TLS session. Uh, there's three different uh, basic protocols used for key exchange in TLS. Uh, RSA uh, key exchange is the most common by far. Uh, it's also bad because it doesn't provide forward secrecy. If uh, a attacker gets the private key from uh, the server, then the attacker can go back in time. He's, the attack has probably recorded all previous encrypted conversations. He can take the private key and decrypt the previous conversations. Uh, with Diffie Hellman encryption, that's not possible. Uh, with Diffie Hellman, um, well, internally it uses RSA as well, but um, you, uh, the attacker cannot go back in time. He can only compromise future connections. So that's a desirable security property. Uh, the disadvantage of Diffie-Hellman is that it's very slow. So up comes elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, which is the best, which everyone should be using. Uh, it's very fast, faster than RSA, faster than diff uh, normal Diffie-Hellman. Uh, we were thinking recently that it might have been backdoored by the NSA, but there's been some very convincing uh, work lately that says no, it's probably totally safe to use. So this is the recommendation nowadays. Uh, ECDHE, uh, we was disabled in Red Hat Dispros until about a year ago due to having concerns on a lot of the upload curves, but we've got it now, so everyone's using that. All, all browsers support that. Servers should be using that. Uh, Cypher is for the um, uh, symmetric key portion of the session. Uh, RC4, very insecure. That's uh, going away. Uh, all major browsers have vowed to disable it in February of next year. So if many servers out there only offer RC4, they're just not going to work in Firefox and Chrome anymore. Uh, Black Cypher, 3DS, AES, Camilla. Uh, block cipher modes, the, this is important. Uh, well, the difference between a swing cipher and a block cipher is that in a swing cipher you go bit by bit and the previous uh, encrypted data is input to the function that determines the next encrypted data. Whereas with a block cipher, uh, it's not bit by bit. You have huge blocks. And you can use any of the block ciphers with any of the different block cipher modes. I'm not sure if that's actually true or not. Uh, but you can, you can mix and match, uh, is the point. Um, so nowadays, the best one to use is probably AES128. Uh, this is uh, electronic code block mode, uh, cipher blockchaining mode. Nobody uses this, it's insecure. This is most commonly used nowadays. GCM is what you should be using. Uh, here's a good cipher suit here, AES128 GCM mode. Any takers on why I didn't list AES256 there? Does anyone know? It's because it's much slower, it's not really much more secure. Um, it's, I mean, AES128 is very secure, no one's going to break that. And AES256 looks like it might be more vulnerable to timing attacks. So bigger is not always better. Um, 
message authentication codes. This allows them perform encryption, but it's what ensures the Z-Tagger doesn't change your message in transit, which is very important. Uh, SHA-1 is the best message authentication code to use. There's no way an attacker is going to be able to break that in real time. You have to break it in real time in order to uh, uh, convince the client that you've, or the server, that you've changed the data and that, it's, that you have not changed the data even though you did and it's all okay. You're not going to be able to do that in real time. Attacks on SHA-1 take weeks. Uh, so the more complicated uh, algorithms are just wasteful. A lot of people enable TLS on their servers and they say, oh no, it's so slow. We're wasting uh, processing time. Time is money. We're wasting power on this. It's because they've enabled uh, unnecessary. Uh, uh, they've made bad choices of cipher suites to use. Like they might be using uh, plain Diffie Hellman, which is slow, or they might be using SHA 256. So, uh, that was my lightning run through the basis of the protocol. I haven't talked about certificates yet. There's two different types of certificates. Quite well, there's three different types of certificates. Two wide <coughs> Domain validation certificates look like this in Firefox. Uh, I picked Firefox to show you the UI just because it's uh, what I had installed. Um, it verifies that you're connected to the right domain, but it doesn't verify anything else. You don't know uh, who runs the domain. This could be like a fake Fedora project website, like a phishing site. You would, the user wouldn't know. You'd just see the uh, green certificate, green, good, secure. But who knows who runs fedoraproject.org? In this case, it's actually the real Fedora project. But could be like Fedora with like a acrylic A or something. <laughs> and it's not the, that's, it looks the same, but it's not actually the same, but it still shows up secure, right? So we're not, uh, it's not asserting anything about the identity as a site, only that you have a secure connection to that site, and that is the site you're connected to. Uh, extended validation certificates go one step farther, and you pay extra money for this, and then they put your company name in the certificate, and like the company address and such, if you uh, go into the exterior, you expand the thingy for more details, you can see more details about the company. So this is how you know you're connected to the real PayPal link. So that means so one percent of users who uh, know that what to look for the extended validation certificate up there will uh, not be fooled when they arrive at PayPal with Perla K and it's an attack site. They'll say, oh, even though it's a green lock icon, I don't see PayPal link here. So this is not the right site to be at. So if you're one of those one percent, you're now in that one percent. You won't be fooled. <laughs> great security there. Great security there. Uh, those are expensive. You don't need those for your website because users <laughs> don't understand what it means. So, quick words about certificate verification. Uh, the, to, the server will send a chain of certificates. Uh, an intermediate cert signed by the root certificate on the system. Um, then, uh, well, the first certificate will send is the certificate for itself, and the certificate for the server will be signed by the intermediate cert, which will be signed by the root certificate that's expected to be installed on the system. Um, at least traditionally, in practice, sites do weird things, and browsers are expected to be compatible with those weird things. Uh, we just recently, in the GNOME stack, uh, Carlos, I, Carlos, fixed a bug. Uh, that was causing Facebook to not display properly because Facebook was sending uh, certificates that were in fact not signed by any of the roots on the system, but which were signed by another certificate with the same private key as one of the roots on the system. <coughs> it's safe. It's safe. We should probably verify it, even though it's not technically a chain of certificates. So now we do in Facebook works again. Uh, there should be at least two certificates in the chain because if there's only one certificate, you would be expecting it to be a root certificate to be signed by a root certificate, right? But root certificates never sign real uh, server certificates in the wild. That's not considered safe. They sign intermediate certificates that way. If they have to revoke an intermediate, an intermediate certificate, then their business isn't screwed. They still have the root certificates that's safe. All right, um, invalid certificates. Uh, when a website has misconfigured its uh, certificate chain, this is Chrome. You'll get uh, I picked Chrome because it has the best warning. It just says your connection is not private. Hackers might be trying to steal your information from self-signed.datssl.com. Huge back to safety button. 
If you click the advanced button here, you can find a way to ignore the error and proceed. <coughs> but you really should, isn't it? Rather, anyway. Um, so that's the first part of my presentation. I was really, that is as far as I got in an hour last time I gave this talk. So I'm glad I sped things up a bit. Questions at this point? No, no, excellent. And they say stop recommending the elliptic curve. They do. No one knows why. So the NSA stop recommended the electric curve cryptography. They say it's not the solution for quantum computers. They're worried about quantum computers breaking the cryptography. Those don't exist yet. Yeah. So is the NSA really worried that they're going to exist in the near future? Are they just trying to convince us to use weaker encryption? Nobody really knows. At this point, you can't take any advice from them seriously because, I mean... Before you could. Well, before you actually could, yes. Uh, the NSA used to be divided into offensive and defensive divisions. The defensive divisions were what gave out the advice until after 9-11. Uh, elliptic curve cryptography was promoted by the defensive division of the NSA 15 years ago, so we think it's probably... I mean, they're using it to protect government data. Uh, it's, uh, certainly, the recommended uh, the recommendation for what you should be using nowadays. Um, they didn't actually recommend that you stop using electric <coughs> curve cryptography. Rather, they recommended that if you haven't deployed it already, don't waste your money on deploying it. It's not going to protect you against attackers of the future. Uh, I don't think I agree. You should be. You should probably be using the best cryptography you have to offer. I mean, it's it's only you can use. Uh, you can. Well, no, it has enough advantages over RSA and plain Diffie Hellman. Uh, I'll talk more about plain Diffie Hellman later in the presentation under the challenges sections. It has enough advantages that you should be using it. Yeah, uh, you I heard Shawan was uh, getting retired in some browsers. You heard what? Shawan. Uh, Shawan. Yeah. Right. Okay. Retired, so. But not as a message or syndication code, as a certificate signing. Uh, okay. For signing certificates, because your certificate, you can attack that offline, right? You can send secret computers at that certificate for weeks, and then eventually. They might be able to generate uh, another certificate that looks the same. I mean, it, 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 it has the, the same SHA-1 signature is valid for that other certificate, but it's not the same certificate as the tax certificate. Right, so um, Chrome and Safari uh, now display those as untrusted. Okay. All right, so achievements. What good things have happened in the past year? Uh, in the past five years or so. Let me preface this by saying that five years ago, uh, the HTTPS, the, the public key ecosystem uh, was in a very bad state. Uh, uh, developers were losing confidence in the security of the ecosystem. Uh, certificate authorities were being hacked. They were issuing rogue certificates. Uh, a bunch of users in Iran, a very famous case, uh, were sent rogue certificates for Google.com. The government read their email. Who knows how many people wound up in prison because of because uh, their uh, TLS session was hacked. So um, uh, bad TLS, depending on where you live, can literally be a matter of freedom and imprisonment. Uh, so. Uh, the browser community, uh, led by Google and Mozilla, uh, have been working hard in the past five years to make the system more robust to such incidents. Um, and they've been relatively successful. So first of all, uh, we succeeded in removing insecure protocols from the TLS stack. Uh, like I said earlier, we no longer support SSL version 3. Uh, we've all decided we're not going to support RC4 anymore. Uh, what could GDK actually disable RC4 over a year ago now? So that's good. Uh, that makes everyone more secure. The cost, of course, is that some websites that support only SSL3, that support only RC4, are no longer accessible in our browsers. Uh, Firefox, I think, has a whitelist of sites that it allows RC4 use in known broken sites. Uh, that's bad for the browsers that don't have the whitelist. We don't have the whitelist in WebKit GDK. Um, so 
but but overall, these are good steps forward. Uh, browsers are generally extremely conservative with um, breaking compatibility with websites. So anytime this, it, it's a very big deal that the browser vendors agree to take these steps. Uh, next content. Uh, mixed content is when you have uh, insecure HTTP served content on an HTTPS site. Um, it's all over the place. You see the little warning triangle in your web browser. The site has some mixed content. Um, that means the page is no longer secure, right? The attacker could have changed that content. What if what, what gets sent with your HTTP request, your insecure request for that content, all the cookies on the page, right? Unless there were secure cookies. But most sites don't bother to mark important cookies as secure. For instance, session cookies. Your bank, if your bank has really marked your session cookie as secure, if it hasn't, and it has no content on the page, then it's trivial for a man in the middle to take control of your session. <coughs> so it's kind of a very serious problem. Uh, but it's hard to change all the links on your page from HTTP to HTTPS. Developers miss links. So the recent solution, uh, which I just learned about very recently, is a new kind of security parallel C header. You put it in the HTTP header for the main resource, and the browser just automatically reads that and then automatically rewrites all the requests to use HTTPS. Problem solved. Uh, this is uh, supported by Chrome, I believe, stable Chrome, and by development version of Firefox. So you can use this, rely on this, your website will be more secure for your users. Uh, we don't support it in WebKGDK. That's a serious problem. Uh, but it's very new, so that's OK. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some, Well, we don't have to support it in WebKit, actually. Uh, all ports would use the same code here, I expect. So um, that's a great achievement. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll have support in other browsers soon. Distrusting read certificates, the two types of certificates in particular is that uh, we don't want to trust anymore. Certificates signed by 1024-bit RSA keys, uh, generally considered to be uh, brute forceable. Uh, the, if, uh, you can uh, go from the 1024-bit RSA public key, attack it with a supercomputer for a year, you can get the private key. So that's no longer considered secure. Uh, Chrome uh, no longer Chrome will display the connection instead of with a secure lock. It will display a little yellow. Just your security is not secure icon. Um, very eloquent, Michael. Your security is not secure. Yeah. <laughs> um, Firefox, I'm didn't test. They might be completely blocking them, or they might just be degrading the security indicator. And WebKit GDK, we don't detect this at all. You can send, you can put this on your website. They'll work just fine. That's not good. That's a disservice to our users. We need to downgrade the security indicator. Uh, but it's a fair bit of work to uh, actually hook up detection for that. We have to uh, add API and various of the libraries we use work its way up the stack to WebKit to get that information. Uh, Shaolin signatures. Uh, UN, this is what uh, you were asking about earlier. Yeah, these, these are not secure and certificates anymore. Chrome and Safari are detecting these now. And WebKit GDK, we're not detecting them yet. Uh, same problem as 1024-bit RSA certs. It, it needs work in uh, GLib networking, GLib, LibSoup. We need new API in all three places, or we can't detect these. So those will be projects for us in the future. Uh, but those are achievements. Uh, the, the other browsers are more secure, and that's great. Hopefully, we will be uh, WebKit GDK will be in the future as well. New security features: HTTP strict transport security. This is the big one. Without HSTS, uh, well, what HSTS does is it tells the browser that this site should never be accessed insecurely. Always mandate HTTPS. If for some reason the certificate is insecure, do not allow the user to proceed past the certificate. It's a HTTP header. You just set it in your. It's it's not even. It doesn't even require code changes on the file. You just add the header to your password configuration file, and magically your site becomes secure. All servers should be using this for all content all of the time. Um, without HSTS, your HTTPS protected site is not really secure because all the man in the middle has to do is when the website receives an insecure request, 
um, the man in the middle can just not upgrade the connection to HTTPS. Normally, when you're a user, you browsing to a website, you don't type into your browser HTTPS <coughs> slash slash PayPal.com. No, you type PayPal.com. That's an insecure request. You're relying on the good graces of the man in the middle attacker to redirect you to the HTTPS version of the site like Pay but the real PayPal would do. No attacker's going to do that. If you're not using HTTPS, your users are actually not secure in the middle of man and during a man in the middle, of <coughs> which is the only thing HTTPS is designed to protect against. So there's no point in using HTTPS. You need to be using HTTPS. It's supported by all major browsers except WebGTK. Uh, and uh, your browsing is not secure if you don't have this. Period. Point blank. That's what? the most important security, new security feature by far. Question? Yeah. Go. Doesn't the man in the middle attacker need to be kind enough to provide that header if it's impersonating PayPal.com in the insecure request? Yes and no. So, uh, <laughs> if the user visits PayPal for the first time, and the first time he visits PayPal.com, he's up against a man in the middle attacker, yeah, then the user is screwed. He gets attacked. But, uh, there is a, uh, but if you visit the legitimate PayPal once, then PayPal will set a, a remembered. duration. Yes, it's remembered in the browser. For the duration selected by PayPal, normally like six months or so. And so in practice, as long as you don't get attacked the very first time, you're good to go. Sure. Makes sense. OK. Uh, HTTP public key pinning is an extension on HSTS. The problem HPKP solves is when a rogue CA issues a uh, and improperly issues a certificate. Uh, for instance, Symantec recently issued a bunch of test certificates for Google.com that would have been valid in the wild had they been used in the wild. Uh, if Google uses HPKP, and so uh, browsers that support HPKP, Firefox, Chrome, Opera, would have just rejected those certificates. Uh, HPKP is, again, an HTTP header. You send the header, and you specify the hash of a certificate or a private key. There's different options you can use. The effect is that no one else can issue certificates for your site except you. You always, issue at least, you always uh, send at least uh, your normal certificate and a backup certificate in case something happens to the first one. Otherwise, you're basically performing a denial of service attack on yourself. You'll never be able to uh, change the header. Users won't be able to. Uh, you'll never be able to change the certificate unless you send F2. You don't have a backup. Um, so uh, this is. It's good to use. Um, most sites probably won't use it, but sites that are concerned for the security users certainly should. Uh, sites that think they are targets, high-profile sites. Um, it's supported in. Most major browsers, uh, I don't think Safari or Internet will have it yet, but they're working on it. At least in an uh, Edge, Microsoft Edge, sorry, the new browser is working on it. Uh, it's not supported in WebKit DK Plus yet. Certificate transparency is a very cool uh, new technology. It's trying to solve the same problem as HPKP. Uh, what certificate transparency is, is uh, well, what it is is complicated algorithms. But the output of the complicated algorithms is a public audit log of every certificate that's been issued by uh, certificate authorities that are trusted in Google Chrome. Um, the effect of this is you can't issue rogue certificates anymore without a public record <coughs> certificate being issued. You can search the log for your website or any website. So if you're, say, you're running the domain google.com, you will have a bot, some automated program watching the audit log, and you will be notified immediately whenever any state issues a certificate for a domain. Uh, it makes it basically impossible to issue rogue certificates. That's cool. Uh, so far, it's only supporting Chrome. Uh, Mozilla is working on an implementation, but they say they're not going to enable it by default. I presume that's going to change in the future. Uh, this is this is really cool stuff. Since as long as the website is actually watching the audit log, they can't be attacked, basically. So, uh, well, the TLS can't be attacked. You can still hack the website, but you can still hack the server. But the TLS doesn't protect against that anyway. So, awesome achievements here. Awesome achievements. Um, <coughs> the combination of these has basically saved the uh, TLS ecosystem. You can have trust. 
that the website you're visiting is actually the right website. Um, it hasn't. You ha you're not uh, connected to a site with a rogue certificate from a rogue CA. Of course, websites have to opt in to all of these features, right? If you don't send the HSPS header, then your users are not protected. If you don't send the HBKP header, your users are not protected. Uh, if you don't ever look at the certificate of transparency audit logs, if your site's not big enough that researchers are looking at the logs for you, your users are not protected. Questions? Um, so it, it seems very good for uh, public websites. Yes. Now we have, we all have like uh, at home or whatever some some websites on some unsecure because we don't have certificates that can be uh, uh, signed. They are auto signed or whatever. So is there any activity in the area to improve a little bit the situation for those websites? For private sites that are only applicable <coughs> on your internal network, yeah. uh, I think the only, well, you can't sign those with a public CA, right? Well, a public CA could sign certificates for those sites, and they do sign certificates for such sites, but that's very bad. When that gets found out, you lose your certificate and your business is destroyed, right? Uh, because such a certificate would be valid for other people's private networks too, right? So that's why public CAs do not issue such certificates. The solution is to create your own CA. You won't be trusted by anyone other than yourself, but that's okay. Um, for if you're setting up your own private server, only accessible on your local network, if you're, if you're running like a company, that's the obvious solution, and that's not even very inconvenient for you. It's not much harder than the cost of setting it up anyway. Uh, if it's like a personal home network, um, I question why you are doing that, why you're... The, the, the traditional case is routers to chip with uh, invalid certificates to access the um, control panel. I don't really have an answer for that problem. There is now a, a CA that's emitting certificates for free uh, for, uh, for, for, for public domain. It's not in no, 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 well. Um, it easy SSR. Uh, if, you, if you're a company, I think I think uh, Let's Encrypt has just entered yeah, public beta, yeah. and they are issuing free certificates for everyone. <coughs> um, I don't know if there's any limitations on their service, but uh, as I haven't heard any complaints yet. Um, the other CA that offers cheap certificates is Starcom. They're, I think they're free for individuals and corporate users have to pay like $5 or something. So, yeah. And don't quote me on that. Look it up for yourself if you need such a certificate. But there's, there's really no, money's not an excuse anymore, right? Yeah. These things are pretty darn cheap. Yeah. Uh, the certificate of thirty business is going to be moving towards extended validation certificates because no one's going to be willing to pay any significant amount of money for domain validated certificates anymore. They're basically free. Yeah. So uh, I guess what I mean is you don't need self-signed anymore, at least. Um, I don't know what to do for the case of a wireless home router. Yeah, yeah, Maybe no. someone else has a solution for that. The private network one, I don't. Uh, but yeah, for, if, if your website is a public domain, you should never have a self-signed cert. Uh, if you think, if, I mean, there's there's no way to ever secure that, right? You don't know who you're connecting to. Okay, challenges. What's still wrong? What do we need to fix? Why you should not trust the lock icon in your web browser. Um, well, certificate communication is not the worst challenge we have, but it's certainly we don't have a good story for certificate revocation yet. Uh, the two traditional protocols for certificate revocation, certificate revocation lists get sent with the certificate. Uh, it's just a huge list, like 15, 50 megabytes of revoked certificates. The browser is supposed to check the, each certificate against the list. Um, so the, nobody uses these anymore, to my knowledge. I mean, they might be supported in some browsers still, but not that I'm aware of. 
the primary disadvantage of these being that if you're downloading a 50 megabyte certificate revocation list, that has to happen before you can display the website. Yeah, not very performant. Everyone thinks it rather slow. So that's why it moved on to better, bigger and better things. Well, smaller and better things. <laughs> Uh, OCSP, online certificate status protocol, is the other traditional form of certificate verification. Uh, supported in Internet Explorer, Safari, Firefox, Opera. The difference is you're not downloading a huge list, you're just sending a request to what's called an OCSP server. Every time you visit a secure website, you will see your browser send the request to this, uh, a server run by the CA that issued the certificate and ask, is this certificate still valid? And the server replies back, yes, it's valid, or no, it's not valid. If the server says, no, it's not valid, it's very close, you can't visit the site. So why do I say this is literally worse than useless? Anyone know? OK, so uh, there's two problems here. Uh, the first problem is that all four of these browsers have decided that if the <coughs> server doesn't respond, well, the secure thing to do is obviously to not show the site, but all the browsers to show the site. They treat no response as secure, not remote. But if there's a man in the middle attack, then the man in the middle is just going to drop your connection to the OCSP server, right? So it provides zero security, except against like a middle school level attacker who doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, uh, so why do I say it's worse than useless? We've established that it's useless. Why is it worse than useless? Because you're sending a record of all the secure sites you're visiting to these certificate authorities. That's not exactly good for your privacy, right? You <laughs> trust these guys to never get hacked? Right. Uh, so, uh, needless to say, uh, Chrome, uh, WebPGDK does not support that. <laughs> yeah, this is like the biggest like, success for WebPGDK tonight. <laughs> Uh, Chrome used to support OCSP, but they dropped it uh, about three years ago. They no longer perform those checks at all. Chrome replaced it with what's called a CRL set, Certificate Revocation List set. It's basically their own Certificate Revocation List, except instead of being controlled by the CAs, it's controlled by Google. So Google only adds a certificate to the list if it says, hmm, this is a really bad problem. We don't want users uh, using this certificate for like high profile incidents big sites that have a revoked certificate for a security reason. The certificate of revocation lists up here, they contain revocations for who knows why the certificate list already is revoked certificates. Maybe a site just chooses to use a new certificate and the CA adds the old certificate to the list. Maybe the CA has some dispute with the customer, the customer stops paying the money, they revoke the certificate early, I don't know. Uh, but needless to say, the CRL set list is much, much, much smaller than the certificate of revocation lists. Um, so, it's effective for Chrome users, um, but it's completely controlled by Google. Uh, it's not something I expect any other browser to ever implement. And it doesn't work for everyone because if you're not one of, if you're not a big important site, you're just not important enough to go into the certificate revocation on the CRL set list. I presume there's any Google developers who want to crush me on that. Go ahead. Uh, one CRL is uh, Firefox's solution, which is very new. It's again a certificate verification list, but they only put intermediate certificates on it, which is how they guarantee it stays small. So if something bad happens to a CA, an intermediate CA cert, uh, Firefox will detect that and, uh, uh, and it will uh, keep the user safe. Uh, but if something happens to an individual website cert, then you're out of luck. So we don't really have any solution that provides certificate revocation to individual websites uh, and does not also suck. Uh, this is going to be a future work. Someone else has to solve this problem. Uh, then hopefully we can have certificate revocation support to work. Uh, Diffie Hellman, uh, if you remember from the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that there's three different uh, public uh, key transfer systems. Key exchange is what it's called. Key exchange uh, systems that are used in TOS, uh, RSA, Diffie Hellman, and one of my Diffie Hellman. In theory, if Diffie Hellman is used properly, it's very secure. It's slow, so if you're running a huge website, you probably don't want to use it for performance and cost reasons, but it's perfectly fine for your users if you do. In practice, uh, it's very easy to get this um, messed up. Uh, the key exchange depends on the size of prime numbers that are used in the um, computation. 
Uh, all modern browsers permit uh, weak primes that don't keep your connection secure. This is for compatibility reasons. If we were to require this connection to actually be secure, too much of the internet would break. Um, what can we do about this? Well, not much, because by the time we find out what size the prime is, we've already negotiated a diffie Hellman key exchange, and there's nothing to be done about it. It's too late. Uh, so uh, we, that option is to either continue with the connection, to just block the connection, or to continue with the connection and degrade the security indicator. Uh, degrading the security indicator is probably the right compromise, because we can't <coughs> break the whole internet. But we also don't want to say these connections are secure. Currently, all browsers say the connections are secure. So we need to improve on that. Same problem exists here for uh, composite parameters. That is, your Diffie Hellman friend is not a prime. No browsers detect that. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> that, uh, that just makes it easier to uh, factor, and we <coughs> don't want to allow that. So we need to degrade the security indicator in that case. Uh, reuse of primes. Uh, we used to think this was fine. We used to think it's totally fine for all websites to use the same prime numbers. But, uh, generators. Obviously, the connection, the, the, it wouldn't be secure if everyone was using the same prime numbers for the entire connection. But to get things started, we decided it was fine to use the same prime numbers. Uh, turns out recent research logjam says, <coughs> no, that's not fine anymore. OK, so 18% of the top HTTPS domains are using the same prime numbers. Uh, we think the US government can uh, read your connections because they the government can attack the prime numbers once, and then it's much, much easier to decrypt the connection after they've done that once. Uh, if you break uh, two primes, then you can decrypt 66% of connections to VPN servers, 26% of connections to SSH servers. If you run a VPN server or an SSH server, you should probably make sure you're not vulnerable to this. Uh, if you run a website, Maybe just turn off Diffie Hellman entirely. Or prioritize it lower than RSA and ECDSA. EC, the elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. D H. E C D H E. Yeah. Right. Or you can dig into your configuration settings and make sure that you've got everything set up safely, but who wants to do that? Who understands how to do that? <laughs> And secure protocol version and fallback. This is probably my favorite security issue. <laughs> so, how is TLS version negotiation supposed to work? The client sends to the server the highest protocol version it supports. The server looks at that, computes the minimum of its highest supported version and the client supported version, and then uses that as a version of the TLS protocol to use. So, if the client supports TLS 1.2, the server supports TLS 1.0 you should get a TLS 1.0 connection, right? OK, so insecure protocol version fallback happens when the client says, I support TLS 1.2. The server says, 1.2, I have no clue what that is. I'm not going to connect to you. What happens then? The browser decides to try to connect again and says, I only support TLS 1.0. Then the server says, oh, OK, I support TLS 1.0. I understand what that is. We can connect. So what's the problem with that? The man in the middle attacker just blocks the first connection attempt. And then he degrades the connection to TLS 1.0. So that's obviously not supposed to be permitted. Why does it happen? Because a particular company that will not be named writes very, very bad TLS servers. And uh, either has not fixed the product or has lots of customers using not fixed products. So what's going to happen when uh, we brought this guy supporting TLS 1.3? This is going to be a problem for many, many more sites. Because the sites are going to the sites support TLS 1.2 now. When they see TLS 1.3, they're going to crap out and say, I don't know how to connect to you, even though it's just an integer comparison. The programmers can handle that for some reason. So most browsers attempt to connect three times TLS 1.2, 1.1, and 1.0, even though <coughs> right, if it doesn't work the first time, the site is very, very broken. Uh, with the GK, we tried twice, just an implementation detail. Uh, Poodle vulnerability. You know, this occurred last year. Uh, why was Poodle such a big deal? It was a vulnerability in SSL version 3 
that almost all websites nowadays support TLS 1.0, almost all browsers nowadays at the time supported TLS 1.2. Who cared about a vulnerability in SSL version 3? It's because an attacker can choose, gets, the attacker always gets to choose which protocol version is in use because of insecure protocol version fallbacks. Uh, who wants to get the door? Yes, great. <laughs> No browsers run after performing fallback. The solution to this problem is, of course, to allow the fallback and then degrade the security indicator to say this is not secure. No browsers do that. Uh, we should do that. Um, there is a small achievement here. We have a fake Cypher Suite that you can add to the, the uh, Firefox and Chrome add to the Cypher Suite list when they attempt to connect the second time. And that tells the server, oh, you're connecting a second time. And then the server thinks, hmm, am I TLS protocol version intolerant? <laughs> no. OK, there's an attack. Of course, the servers that are intolerant are not going to check that. <coughs> you're, you're relying on the server to, to um, not exhibit the bug that it's supposed to check against, right? So it's not really a useful solution. But well, it, it protects when the it protects against the case where the server is doing everything right and also checking for the signal inside the suite. In theory, the server should stop the connection then. In reality, will any servers do that? I don't know. Other problems? I only have two things on this list. This could be much longer. Um, server lock secure renegotiation extension. There's a TLS extension. Server is supposed to send the extension to say, I'm not vulnerable to this vulnerability. That's really all you have to know about it. Um, there's two ways to be not vulnerable to the vulnerability. You can either disable renegotiation, or you can say, I, or you can use the secure renegotiation extension. Most servers have chosen to just disable renegotiation. Many servers, very many servers, have not done either. They're insecure. Your web browser is not going to detect it, it's not going to warn you. Uh, in reality, we should degrade the security indicator anytime the renegotiation extension is missing, because without that extension, the browser has no way to know the connection is secure. In practice, that's going to take make most sites out there look not secure in the browser. That's fine, in my opinion. That's the incentive for the sites to improve. So browsers need to start checking for that. Key uses violations. When a CA gives you a certificate and says it's valid only for email signing, then you put it on a TLS server and use it for your website. Uh, browsers are not supposed to allow that. Uh, they do. Uh, for compatibility, that should be on the integrated security indicator. Conclusion. Epiphany is the least secure web browser out there. Uh, at least with respect to TLS, by far. Uh, we have this huge list of security features that we do not support. We have no UI for displaying UV certificates, all of the brothers do. We don't support HSTS, all of the brothers do. No HP Kiki. Not all browsers have that yet, but Chrome and Firefox do, and it's pretty important. No certificate transparency checking. That was a big deal, right? You can't issue rogue certificates anymore. So even though only Chrome is doing that right now, we should definitely be doing that too. No support for certificate verification checking, although in fairness, there's not really any non-terrible way to do that now. All other browsers are nevertheless finding some way to do it. We don't warn about any weak certificates. We don't warn about uh, weak diffy common parameters. No warnings for the other issues I mentioned. Yeah, other browsers aren't doing these. So these five are where we're behind. But if we're going to do all this, this is icing on the cake, right? We can definitely want to use about these problems. So the act, uh, what problems would we have if we were to start degrading our security indicator in these situations? Well, most websites would no longer display as secure. That's not great. The users should. The the problem is that users will open Epiphany and say, oh. The, uh, well, the user's not going to know about weak Diffie Hellman parameters, but say you visit the site that uses weak Diffie Hellman parameters, you see some Epiphany says the browser is not secure, the site is not secure, it opens Firefox, Firefox says it is secure. Oh, Epiphany must be broken, right? <coughs> what if Chrome were to warn about these certificates before Firefox does? Oh, Chrome must be broken, I'll go use Firefox. That's why browsers don't want 
to add support for detecting and warning users about these problems. No one wants to be the first one to do it. So maybe we should warn about these only after someone else does so first. <coughs> then no one's ever going to do it. Chicken and egg. All right, so uh, at this point, any further questions? No. All right, so this was the bulk of my presentation. Actually, I'm going to say it's the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening, guys.